We shall return to the Gospel according to Mark chapter 15, reading from uh, verse 22. Mark 15 and verse 22. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mingled with mold, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what it should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him. Now we looked last night at uh, the story of the Lord's agony in Gethsemane. And that agony has been called the shadow of Calvary. It was, as we saw, a horrendous experience for the Lord, and yet it wasn't the bottom of the abyss, it was only the shadow of Calvary itself falling before. And I want tonight to draw your attention to the actual narrative of the cross itself, and I want to try to cover as much as I can of the actual details of the story. Let's remind ourselves, first of all, of the incidents themselves. I do suppose that we know them well, and yet they will always bear a retelling. The more is to begin with that the Lord is forced to carry his own cross. It compels Simon, we are told, to carry his cross, but only because the other Gospels tell us the Lord himself became too exhausted to continue this journey. Remember that before the crucifixion there has been all the agony of the betrayal and the arrest and the scourging and the mocking and so on. By the time the Lord came to that long journey towards Golgotha, his physical strength was gone. And as part of the execution ritual, the condemned man was carried the crossbeam of the cross himself. The Lord did so, so far as he was able. But his strength is quickly exhausted because of his weak condition, and somebody else is pressed into this particular service. I want just to make one observation upon this detail, and it's this. But when the Lord says to us to take up our cross and follow him, he wasn't at all talking metaphorically of our own pains and our own sufferings. He was saying to the church of his own day that to follow him was like signing your own death warrant. You might as well, here and now, take up your cross. And I think that we must avoid all temptation to water down the implications of the Lord's language. We are crucified to the world. We must take that in total and unqualified seriousness. We are turning our back upon so much upon the world's whole scale of values, upon all its priorities. And that language must take you and me back tonight and back, back always to this terrible sight here of God's own Son carrying his own cross to the place of immolation and to the place of death. It is a measure of the totalness of a commitment that God asks us in Jesus Christ. The second point I want to note is this. They brought him to the place called Golgotha. Now, it's worth noting, just for this reason, that we very seldom speak of Golgotha, we speak of Calvary. And there are so many hymns that use the word Calvary because the word is 
if I may use such language here, it is a euphonious word. It's a word of great beauty in itself, Calvarius. And it sounds lovely in poetry. And it's been, I think, all too easy for the church to sentimentalize the whole transaction around this green hill far away. Now in the New Testament we aren't told that it was a hill. We aren't told it was green. And it's very seldom called Calvary, although it is called Calvary by Luke. The word Golgotha, it's a much harsh, harsher word because of its gutturals. And it's a reminder to us, I think, in that fact itself, that Calvary really wasn't a lovely place. Its associations weren't lovely. It was a terrible place of doom and of ugliness. And it was transacted on Calvary at Golgotha for you and me wasn't lovely. It wasn't a lovely sight to behold. John, for example, the beloved disciple, takes the Lord's mother away from the cross before the end. Because of the agony, it must have involved for her. And I do think it is of, of enormous importance for us not to sentimentalize the cross, <coughs> never to lose sight of its barbarousness, of its ugliness, of the sheer horrendousness of all it represents. We mustn't obscure the harsh realities behind the deceptive but accidental beauty of our own human language. But it's also worth insisting on this, that he was crucified at a place. In other words, we aren't talking about ideas or concepts or figures of speech, but something which happened one day in the life of one man at a certain place at a certain time, crucified under Pontius Pilate. The Christian faith is not based on ideas, it's based upon events. Christ took our place. Christ suffered on a real cross, on a real hill, with real nails, real blood, a real spear, real thorns. But again, to this whole problem, of the body, of the three-dimensionalness of the Christian faith. But those who are in contact with the more economic riches of current theology will be aware that one of its great attacks is upon the historicity of what I may call the facticity of the New Testament Gospels. And that's why it is so important for us never to, to lose sight of the fact that these are real events that happen to a real man in a real body. They're not concepts or ideas. They actually happen in our own human history. And then again we note this. The words of verse 22, 23, they offered him wine mingled with myrrh, but he did not take it. Now we know that afterwards, towards the end of the suffering, the Lord does accept a sponge dripped, dipped in vinegar, in bitter wine. But the concoction offered to him in verse 23 was a very special concoction. It was an anesthetic given as a matter of course to all condemned men by the women of Jerusalem. It was an act of kindness on their part, it was a voluntary charity which existed to perform this small ministry of mercy to those doomed to suffer so horribly. But the Lord rejects it. Now it may not be entirely safe to speculate why, but I think one reason was precisely the fact that it was an anesthetic. We are told in Hebrews 2 that the Lord actually tasted death. He didn't go through it as one's senses were numbed, 
or his consciousness was lowered. But he went through it with all his senses at a heightened point and level of efficiency. Well, one of the great problems in our own society, if problem is the right word, is that very, very few people actually taste death. Because most people today die heavily sedated and anaesthetized. It was an interesting point in the final days of the late Lloyd Jones, for example, that he insisted on minimal medication because he wanted, in the faith of Christ, to face the last enemy consciously and deliberately. <clears throat> now the Lord, of course, is here suffering vicariously. And he is going to suffer without mitigation. And he's also not only suffering, but he is acting. And it is going to act it's important that his senses and his mind should not be dulled. And therefore he declines this particular anesthetic. But it's worth bearing in mind that at the end of his agony again, the Lord cries with a loud voice, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he cries, it is finished, that great shout of triumph. At no point is there a loss of consciousness or even a loss of rationality. He must taste that cup to the very extreme and to the very last. And therefore he declines the anesthetic. And then we have the incident but before us in verse 24, they divide the Lord's garments among them. Now it's a small detail, but bear in mind what it presupposes. It presupposes the ultimate shame at a physical level that the Lord was crucified utterly and totally naked, and in that state he hangs upon the cross with all the sensitiveness of which as God's immaculate and innocent son, he was capable. And that was part of the shame and humiliation that he was called upon to experience. And it is also, I think, worth reminding yourselves of the callousness of the soldiers, the marvelous indifference, not only to the Lord's sufferings, but also to the making of history itself. These men are throwing dice at the foot of the cross on which the Lord of Glory was being crucified. They watched him being crucified as they played with their dice. And as they gambled, one of the prizes was the Lord's seamless garment. It shows, does it not, the uselessness of knowing Christ after the flesh. We imagine, of only we had seen with all that vividness, the crucifixion. If only we had seen the pathos, the agony, the pain of it all. If we had felt and tasted the drama, then we too would have been so impressed, we would have turned to God. But it made no impression at all upon these soldiers. And suppose I were to describe to you tonight in great and unsparing detail all that the Lord suffered. What would it do? Unless God's Spirit opens our hearts to see beneath the surface into what Paul calls the word of the cross. Sitting down, they watched him there. And so we have all these little details. He carries his cross. He comes to a place called Golgotha. He declines the anesthetic. He is stripped naked. And then the last great detail. And they crucified him. Now it is interesting and suggestive that the Gospels tell us so little as to what this process actually involved. 
And many expositors have felt on the basis of that that they ought not to enter at all into any of the details of this particular ordeal. But you must bear in mind that in the time of the Gospels, this wasn't an uncommon occurrence. It was a public spectacle that attracted large crowds, and its actual details were well known. And I don't think it does us any harm to remind ourselves of something of what the Lord actually was called upon to suffer. The Lord, as we saw, had to carry his own cross. Now we know that he only carried the actual cross member, the cross beam, the horizontal beam, because the vertical posts were usually left standing on the ground. He carried the cross beam. And when he came to Golgotha and was stripped, he was lay down and his hands were fastened to the crossbeam by nails driven through the palms. That crossbeam was then attached to the vertical post of the cross itself with nails or with thongs. And then the feet of the victim were pierced by one nail driven through the ankle bones and he was fastened to the vertical post by that barbaric method. We know too that on that vertical post there was a small seat upon which the victim could get a measure of support to prevent uh, the hands and feet being utterly torn and lacerated. <coughs> that also of course uh, prolonged the agony of the victim. Now uh, it is excruciatingly painful it was the most horrific form of torture known to the ancient world. It was confined by the Roman power to slaves and to foreigners. It wasn't a Jewish method of execution at all. It involved not only the actual pain of the nails, but the immolation hanging suspended for many, many hours upon that cross, naked, taunted, tormented, the fluctuations of intense heat and intense cold, dehydration, the flow of blood to the extremities, to the feet, and so on, all those agonies. And we know that the Lord hung upon that cross for a long, long time before he at last dies, and he dies, as you'll see, prematurely. Sometimes men hung literally for days upon the cross. The Lord didn't suffer that. He hung upon it only for a matter of some nine hours. Well, those are some of the actual historical details. Let's go on to reflect for a moment now upon some of the symbolic details that are built into this great but simple narrative. There are some facts in the narrative which are, I think, highly uh, meaningful in terms of her own very evocative symbolism. For example, Golgotha is outside the city. Remember, Jerusalem was a holy place. It was holy to God, because that's where God's temple was. It was far too holy for a cross. And it seems to me most suggestive that one day it was too holy for the Son of God himself. He had become an accursed thing, and that for he's crucified outside the city wall. Now oh, we are ourselves enjoined in Hebrews to go out to him outside the gate, bearing his reproach. Jerusalem was too holy for Jesus. He becomes the man outside the outcast and the reject. And that's why it is always a part of our own Christian holiness 
to be separate from the world because he is crucified outside and we go forth to him outside the gate bearing his reproach mm. our separateness our outsideness we know too from verse 33 that there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour and we don't know exactly what it was that caused the darkness sometimes in the Near East climatic conditions can cause a very intense darkness even in the middle of the day and this may have been one such phenomenon but Mark thought it important enough to record it and it is a symbol I think of the gathering darkness in the Saviour's soul it is also I think a symbol of the Lord's relationship with creation itself because the world was made by him and it's at one level as if creation itself were sympathizing with its maker at another level it is as if the eclipse of him who is the light of the world brought derangement even into the physical creation itself remember he is the one who was upholding all things he is the light of the world and now he has died he's been crucified and in the violence that he suffered it is as if creation itself is also the suffering the violence and there is a symbolism also you recall of the red veil in the temple you have it away down there in verse 38 the curtain or the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom now that happens at the very moment when the Lord according to Mark breathed his last at that point when his work is completed the veil is ruptured and the veil was the great symbolic barrier between God and man in the Old Testament no Jew could pass through that veil into the near presence of God only the high priest once a year carried the blood of the God of atonement but now we see that with the death of Christ there is a way open so that we may come with boldness to the very throne of God and we may do so not through some intermediary but we may do so each one of us on his own account personally the barrier is ruptured we can go through this red veil and speak face to face with God himself so there is a symbolism of the outsideness, there is a symbolism of the darkness, the symbolism of the red veil, and there is a symbolism at last of the cross itself. Cursed is every one that hangs upon a tree. And the Apostle Paul and the Jews with him, they saw that cross as itself an expression of God's attitude. This man who was crucified, he was anathema. He was accursed. He was an unholy thing. And that moves beyond to my next concern, and that is to ask what was it that Christ really suffered? We've seen some of the incidents. We've seen some of the symbolism. But what was the core, what was the essence of what he actually suffered. Well, that suffering, we know, came from a threefold source. It came, first of all, from men. And that's a fairly complicated and very varied line of approach. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, 
all the Jewish establishment, all its great theologians, its politicians, its leaders, all these conspired to effect the crucifixion of the Savior. There was Judas Iscariot to betray him. There were the eleven who forsook him and fled. And maybe above all there was Peter who denied him. All of these had played significant roles in the drama so far. And so too had Herod and Pilate and the soldiers and the mob. And then as he hangs upon the cross, we find the hatred and the invective and the inhuman barbarism. We find it continuing as the Lord hangs there. We find it especially in the threefold chorus of mocking, as it's been called. We find in verse 29, those who passed by, they mocked him, and they wobbed their heads and said, Ha, ah, you'd build a temple in three days, and now come down from the cross. So the cross is beside the highway, and everyone is passing by is mocking this naked man as he hung suffering this exquisite torture. And the chief priests too, we see, verse 31, isn't it marvelous? Because they were the educated people and the cultured people. And, you know, you'd have thought, well, no self-respecting middle-class person would have gone to see a public execution. And yet, they're drawn there by their curiosity and by their hatred of the Savior. Not only so, but they so far lose their dignity that they to participate in the chorus of mocking. It must have been some spectacle. The Jewish cabinet and all the college professors and they were there mocking this man as he hung upon the cross of Golgotha. And Mark tells us too in verse 32 that those who were crucified with him they reviled him. <clears throat> now that's interesting because we know that eventually one of those crucified with him, one of them repented and asked the Lord for forgiveness. But as he hangs there between those two terrorists, they too join in the mocking. Now we should never forget that 50 days after this event, the Christ of the cross poured forth the Spirit in abundant blessing upon the city of Jerusalem. It was a small city, and in that city on one day, 3,000 souls were born into the kingdom of God. And among them, there must have been many who were at the cross taking part in the chorus of mocking. It was Easter time, Passover time. The city was thronged with Jews on pilgrimages. One day they went to Golgotha because it was the most interesting tourist site of the day. At Pentecost, the temple was the place to be. The same people. We know too from the early chapters of Acts that many priests believed in Jesus. And what I'm trying to suggest to you is that when the Lord prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, that prayer found an abundant answer at Pentecost. It is a great thing that the blessing fell upon the Jew first, because it was those very Jews who had clamoured for his blood and 
invoked his crucifixion. And upon these very people, Christ pours forth his redemptive blessing after his resurrection. And those lips which had screamed with hatred, crucify, 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 and joined in that chant, it was those same lips which at Pentecost spoke forth in many tongues the wonderful works of God. What a reversal Pentecost was going to effect. And then secondly the suffering came through the devil and through his servants. First through men. And then there was also and always that terrible satanic element. I'm not going far into that. But it was his hour and the power of darkness. And all around him Jesus could see the evidences of satanic action. Those priests, those mobs, those passers-by, those soldiers, even maybe in the darkness itself, there was a satanic power that could be felt. And all the power of the temptation and all its possibility come down from the cross. And how insidious, how alluring that was in the moment of his agony. But I hasten on to the most important thing, which is this. The involvement of God the Father in the sufferings of the Son. There were men, of course, acting, and the demons were acting, but above all, God was acting, and at last, that's what was going to hurt. He was being crucified by God's determinate counsel and foreknowledge, and furthermore, he was being delivered up by the Father. Let us never, never forget that. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And it wasn't any kind of remote control, but the Father's direct agency at Calvary. That is the last thing, that is the ultimate mystery for me. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. <coughs> He hath put him to grief. He made him who knew no sin to be sinned instead of us. It was at last the Father's activity that the Son of God was face to face with at Golgotha. And of course that dimension of the experience is what is expressed for us so sublimely and so unfathomably in what we call the cry of dereliction. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, I don't want to go too far into this because it really is the most holy ground and part of my reluctance to have discussion or questions afterwards is that it will really at one level dissipate the effect of what I say on this. It will lead us, I'm sure, inevitably also into unprofitable hair-splitting academic questioning, which I think is inappropriate at this point. And if there is any resentment of the fact of no discussion, it really has been, I think, a lifelong practice of mine, an experience of mine too at conferences, that on themes of this kind, it is not helpful to move directly from preaching to questions. We must, I think, at last be silent before the cross for a moment and reflect, and then maybe come up with some reverential questions, no doubt. But if I may move on to explore a little of what I think is conveyed to us by these words. 
they are a reminder to us, first of all, of the withdrawal, the withdrawal from the Lord's consciousness and the Lord's mind of everything that was fitted to comfort him. Every comfort is withdrawn. Now bear in mind, every earthly comfort had already been withdrawn. There was no worldly resource left. There was no physical strength. There was no freedom. There was no wealth. No influence. There was no friend, there was no comfort of any kind, nothing to cool him, nothing to warm him. There is absolutely no earthly comfort. The only possible comfort left was the comfort of heaven, the comfort of God himself. And when at last that is withdrawn from him, there is nothing left. There is no comfort at all. Well, it is worth, I think, reminding ourselves that the cry of the comes towards the very end of the Lord's agony. But I don't think it lasted very long because both before it and afterwards we know that the Lord breathes a different spirit and speaks a very different language. We know, for example, that uh, before the cry, he has such assurance as to be able to say to the thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. We know too that before the cry, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we know that after the cry, before he dies, he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So that on both sides of the dereliction, there is Abba. Well, I, I said last night, the humiliation isn't a point, it's a line. And even the cross itself is a process. As the Lord goes further and further down into the darkness and further and further down into the deep. And the bottom, the ground of the abyss, the very end of the journey, is that point at which he cries, Why hast thou forsaken me? That point, every comfort which he had up to the cross this withdrawal and even the comfort that he had on the cross itself up to that point and he did have some comfort on the cross but that comfort is now withdrawn and now there is nothing God the last resource the only resource the only comfort God has been withdrawn and what does it mean? It means the loss of the sense of his own sonship. He doesn't say Abba. He says Eloi, my God. Now bear in mind that he's still saying my God. The grasp of faith is still there. The Lord never became a doubter, never became an unbeliever. My God. Or it isn't Abba. One of the great words of John Calvin and the need of Martin Luther too, as these great men pondered the person and work of Christ, a pondering that was the, the very heart of the Reformation mission. Luther spoke of Christ as being incognito. Calvin spoke of him as being veiled, cryptic. And we know that all through his life there was a veil. People couldn't recognize him for the divine, eternal Savior he was. But the terrible thing that's happening on Golgotha 
is that the veil at last obscures his identity even from himself. There is a moment when not only do men not recognize him, and the disciples don't recognize him, but when he himself hardly knows himself that he is God's son. The veil is so complete. There is a loss of a sense of his own sonship. There is a loss of a sense of the Father's love, not a loss of the love, because God never ceased loving him. We assured him. There is a loss of the assurance of victory. If the victory were already won, and he prayed, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. I finished it. There was such assurance, such strength and hope and confidence. But not now. There's no father now, no love, no assurance of victory. There is a why. Why? What's happening? Why is it happening? There is this point that when the Lord himself is losing grasp of the logic, losing grasp of the relationships, losing grasp of the issues, the darkness, the lonely question, and while I want to safeguard totally the absolute uniqueness of the experience as experienced only by Christ himself, I do think it is precious that the times in our lives when we say, why? Why me? Why this? What is this? What is this? That these are times that God understands. God understands the questions. The Lord at last is facing God only in interrogation. Why? But it isn't only that all comfort is withdrawn it wasn't simply negative. There is what he called in Gethsemane this cup which is given to him in the place of the comfort. There is something put in. It isn't simply a vacuum. And what is it? What fills the Savior's soul? Well, I think that the broad answer to that must be this a sense of evil Elizabeth spoke this morning of the atmosphere that one breathes in India itself <coughs> and sometimes in this land of our own in certain contexts one can be very conscious of the imminence of hell and the reality of its power and presence. And I am certain that on Calvary the Lord felt that far beyond any power of ours to feel, to be sensitive to the presence of hell and its influences. Hell was everywhere here. Golgotha was hell. The gates of hell, its wisdom, its malice, its cunning, its ferocity, its apparent victory. It was all here, and the Lord felt it. And he felt the sin that he was. And he felt the shame of his sin, the sin that he bore. And he felt the wrath of God and the rejection of God. And he didn't feel it as an innocent man, but as a man liable to it, guilty because of others' sin. 
and God turning his back upon the sin that he was. A sense of evil, a sense of sin, 